Hello there, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. Welcome into the studio. You're tuned directly into the Hidden Entrepreneur Show. You know that. You also know that I am your host, Josh Carey. Let me ask you this. Why do you think some businesses succeed and some businesses fail? Have you ever asked yourself that question? And maybe even more personally, have you ever asked yourself that question? Why something you set out to accomplish succeeds or doesn't? Well, our guest today may have the answer for us. It's Dr. Robert Lucier, and he's been a professor of management for more than 30 years. He's the publisher of 12 best-selling business books, all about the topics of leadership and management. He's also, listen to this, he's the prolific author of more than 444 publications with over 1 million people globally having used his publications and business books. He is literally a gentleman and a scholar. Help me welcome Dr. Robert Lucier. How are you, doctor? Great, I'm glad to be with you today, Josh, and looking forward to the interview. So am I, so am I. So let's get right into this. So you developed something called the Lucier Success Versus Failure Prediction Model. I know it's been used in seven different countries, so something tells me it's got to work, it's got to be accurate. What, what is that about? Where, where do we begin with that success versus failure? How can you predict that? Well, one of the things like you were mentioning, did you ever ask yourself that question? This was my actual original dissertation from my doctorate degree. And I just used to drive around sometime and you see a closing and you see another one, you got big lines out the door. And I was saying, why? Why is some of these business succeeding and failing? So I decided to do the research on that. So I basically went to the literature and read a bunch of articles saying these are success failures, these are not. And there was a lot of contradiction through the literature about what does make the difference between success and failure. But what I did is taken the variables from the different journal articles, then I gathered information on chapter 11 businesses or basically failed. And then you look at the successful ones that I matched up with them, and then you that's how it basically developed the model. But I can tell you some of the key variables that make a difference between success and fail because what the model actually does is 15 variables, but they're not all as important as others. And what the, the idea is, you know who's the successful businesses, who's the fail, and the model will say, what category? Is this a successful or failed business? And it's over 80 you know, like 80 something percent accurate. In some other countries, it was even higher than that. So the idea is, can you predict a business as either success or failure based on these variables? So some of the key variables are capital. If you start to undercapitalize, some businesses just go under. If they had more capital and they could have lasted longer, they may have been able to make it, but they didn't have enough. And one of the things we find with capital is that people totally underestimate how much it's going to cost to start and run a business. And they overly exaggerate how much revenue is going to come in. And then they're in trouble. And one of the things that everybody says is get your very best accurate prediction on what it's going to cost you to run your business, your best prediction on your revenues, and at least double it or maybe triple because, you know, it's just not going to run that way. The businesses are always more expensive than you think, and your revenues are always going to be less than you think. So you got to be careful. Another key variable is your record keeping and financial controls, because a lot of people don't keep track as well as they should. And next thing you know, they're running in the red, and they're just bleeding money. And there's just, you got to be in control. You got to have a decent budget and stay within your budget is a key factor. Another one is experience. You know, obviously, if you start a business you know nothing about, you never worked in a restaurant, you start a restaurant, you're going to have a little bit of trouble succeeding. So it does help to have some background. And management experience helps too. Less so if you're an independent person running a business by yourself. But if you're going to have employees, some management experience does definitely help. Not critical in the sense, but it does it definitely helps. 
A lot of people think about business planning. Some people say, oh, you don't need a business plan. Other people say, yeah, you do need a business plan. But the research shows that the companies in my surveys that I've done, the successful companies do make business plans. It doesn't mean you gotta have to follow it 100% and everything's never gonna change, but at least you have some idea of what you're all about. And it's really a good exercise to sit down and really say, what are your goals? What are your, you know, what is your, who are your customers? How are you gonna reach them? A good marketing plan before you start. Because if you don't have any idea, and again, you have to be flexible. One thing I always liked about Peter Drucker said, is a lot of times people start a business, then they'll find out, well, that's not quite the business that I thought it was gonna be where it's working. For example, I'm an entrepreneur from Springfield College and I was running a consulting firm and I was originally thinking my market would be to have different businesses send their employees to the college and I would train them how to be better managers. And I wasn't getting a lot of success, but some of the companies said, well, why don't you come to us and do a custom program for our business? So same idea, just the, the idea is you go where the business is. Sometimes you think this is maybe where the market is and then you find out it's not. And you gotta be flexible to go with it. So you want a business plan, but always being open to making changes. You mentioned then, the, um, I'm sorry, you mentioned the word entrepreneur. What exactly yeah. is that? Okay, well, entrepreneur versus entrepreneur, um, the two-time entrepreneur, meaning you are running your own business, your own show, you have no support from anybody else. As an entrepreneur at Springfield College, I had the support of the college. So basically, I was running a business within a business. That's what an entrepreneur mm. is. Thank you. I also was an entrepreneur at the college because I ran an Israeli program. So it was like a company within a company, which I ran. But that's much more secure because I got a regular paycheck. There's no real risk like there is in being an entrepreneur where you're on your own. Nobody's supporting you in that true sense. So that's a big difference. And it's, I've, you know, I've done both sides of it. And it's a lot more secure when you've got that backing of a big company that's kind of got especially if they got big pockets to help support the business. So you don't have to worry about it and very little risk. So what happened is we eventually stopped the consulting business and I didn't change my job at all. I didn't have to get laid off or anything. And with the Israeli program, again, I just went back to more teaching versus more administrative work. What so, exactly are you doing today? I'm just actually focusing more on my public speaking business. I'm a keynote speaker and my thing I do best and do the most of, I do a variety of topics in management, but publish don't perish is my key. And I have a website called publishdonotperish.com, which talks about what I do there. And it also lists all of the other business management topics. Cause like you said, I have books in leadership. I have books in human relations. I have books in, you know, regular management. So I've done a lot of training programs as well. So I kind of do that as well as the keynote speaking on academic focused. So you so, have, you have a doctorate, you have some masters, you have credentials, you've been a professor for over 30 years, you're, you're all kinds of academic engaged, but your website and your main focus today has publish, publish, do not perish in the title. Does right. that mean that you just have the passion because everything you do, I mean, these 444 plus publications, certainly those are published and written. Is that the core of your skill and passion? Well, that's the first. What, there's two things they say if you want to be successful in business. One is you got to do something you're good at, and I am good at teaching. And the second one is something you love to do the topic that you have skill at. So clearly I have the skill at publishing with over 444 publications. So I've got the, the interest, the motivation, the passion, and I've also have the skill that I can actually do it. And if you go to my website, publish do not perish, you'll see me actually doing a presentation at the website, just five minute blip, but it'll give you an idea of my skill at presenting. So you got to have the talent, to do the job and you got to have the also the interest 444 plus published publications what 
personally do you do you credit what traits do you have do you embrace that have allowed you to get to that number well the key thing is ability and willingness to work and you just gotta one of the things i try to tell people when i do my publish don't perish stuff is it's an input output relationship and what happens is a lot of people say oh i want to publish i want to publish but when you say how many hours are you actually sitting down and actually at writing or doing your research, how many hours are you actually doing that? And people say, well, how can I be so successful? But one of the things as a professor, the thing that worked out nicely in the sense is we're expected to publish. So I would typically put in about 20 hours a week on teaching and about 20 hours a week on publishing. So they gave me a lot of time and effort to put into it. And also one of the key things a lot of people say, Oh, you have the summers off, you can just hang around. I worked all summers a lot. I, that's when the key time, time to write was so I could put in 40 hours, 50 hours a week writing all summer long for the most part. Take a few weeks off, but I mean, I wasn't taking the whole summer off. Part of it is an input-output relationship, and that's the key. If you want to start a business, if you're not willing to work hard, forget it. You're never going to succeed. And it's not what about sitting back relaxing. Yeah. And I, I love that you said, put in the work. How much work are you putting in? Why, why do you think people on paper will say, oh, I want to do that. I want to live that dream. I want to be successful. They'll say it and say it and say it. And then you simply come back with, well, how much are you writing or how much work are you putting in? And they're not, and they almost don't. Where is that disconnect? What in the world is that about? Well, the big thing is priorities in life. Everything's about priorities. If you say something's important to you, then you're going to do it. And if, and you, if you're just saying it's important, but you're not putting the time, then it's really not important to you. One of the things I've always liked the statement about the idea of time management, there's never enough time to do everything that you want to do, but there's always time to do what's most important to you. So yeah. if something's important, you're going to do it. Just like working out is important for me. I work out five days a week with weights. I'm a bodybuilder and I make it a priority. I do it. I just don't say, and the same with writing, obviously I got to, there's always deadlines to meet with writing. You got to have chapters in, you got to get, there's always deadlines and I'm always have a con, I have a motto. I don't meet deadlines. I beat deadlines. That's my motto, and that's what I do. I just get the work done. You got to just, and a big factor is people just can't sit down and concentrate and do the work. They just too jittery. They got to be playing with their Facebook. They got to be jumping here. They got to be jumping there. I mean, also, if you just think about people that own a business, how much time are they really? putting in, focusing on making that business success versus just wasting time doing unimportant things and whatever. And the key thing is sales. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, what's the number one job? Sales, sales, sales. If you're not out there, sales, 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 forget it. You're never going to succeed. So mm -hmm. how much time and effort are you putting into sales versus fooling around? Doing, I shouldn't say fooling around, but there's always busy work that can be done. You can sweep the floor. You can, but what are you doing? What's really important? And the key is I, I'm a total believer in you got to reward performance, not busyness. Because a lot of people look really busy and they're not. And it just reminds me once when I was in school and there were two secretaries that could do some work for me. And one of them, like, oh, he seems so busy doing so much. The other one kind of laid back. And I said to my mentor professor, I said, you know, she seems so. He said, no, Bob, you got it wrong. The one who's so busy is just busyness and not is anywhere near output of the other one. The other one looks more laid back and relaxed, but she's pumping out more work than the other one. It's not about busyness. It's about knowing what to do. So if you're talking about entrepreneurship, you know sales are important put your time and effort into the sales. Mm, I'd love to go back to the beginning. Take us all the way back to little Dr. Robert becoming on the road to becoming the Dr. Robert we know today. Take us back to your childhood. Paint that picture for us, please. What was that like? 
Okay, well, that's, you know, I didn't have the academic background. Actually, back in the olden days, very few people that there was no fault divorce. When I was a kid, there was no fault divorce. And people always stayed together for the most part. Very few people separated got divorced, but my parents got separated. So as a preschooler, I was first put into boarding schools. Then I was put into, uh, excuse me, I first was in foster homes and then put into boarding schools until the sixth grade when my mother took us out of, my two brothers and I out of, out of the boarding schools and we lived with her. So I had no academic background to speak of and no real interest at all. I mean, even through high school, I never even took one college course in high school, not even one. What ended up happening is I actually, in my junior year, when you go to talk to your advisor, I said to my advisor, you know, I'm thinking about going to college. Do you think I should take a college prep course or two? He looked at me and said, college doesn't want you. You're only average. Mm. That's what my guidance counselor told me. College doesn't want me. I'm only average. And today I've got a doctor's degree over 444 publications. So a big factor wasn't my natural ability, but my ability to work hard. And there's a success formula. Performance is the ability times the motivations times the resources. I didn't have a lot of natural ability academically, but I had the motivation to put in the hard work and effort and to succeed. Let me ask you some of the details of that. So your parents got separated and divorced at an early age. Your father's out of the picture. You and your three brothers are trying to be raised by your mother. Um, and then you were ultimately shortly thereafter put into foster care. At what age was that? Okay, so I, the foster care was, when I was preschool, we first started in foster care. And then what happened was in foster care, this, we were three brothers, and it's hard to place three boys in any foster care scenario. So the social worker suggested go to boarding school instead. So we originally went to St. Ian's Orphanage in Methuen, Massachusetts, and that was basically run by nuns. And so when you got to the point of pu uh, puberty, they don't really want you anymore. So they shoved, so that you would go to Working Boys Home, which was in Newton, Massachusetts at the time. And the brothers, a brother is like a male nun, basically. They don't say mass, et cetera, but they actually took care of us. They taught us, et cetera. So they, you know, supervised the dorms, all that sort of thing in a boarding school scenario. But then we eventually, my father started to make more money and was able to say, okay, instead of paying for boarding school, I'll give your mom the money and you guys can live with your mom. And then that's what we did in the, when I was in the sixth grade. Wow. So that's about, uh, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. Prior to that growing up, you're in, you're, you're in a boarding school. You're, you're through the foster care system. As, as a child, what do you remember about the kind of child you were, which really is about how in the world did you process all of this? Well, I was very good at uh, defense mechanism, you know. I was very good at defense mechanism. And part of my attitude was, because kids in that scenario usually don't have great self-esteem and whatnot, and they hate rejection. So one of the things I did was I'll reject you before you reject me so I don't get rejected. So mm -hmm. that was a big part of it. And one of the unfortunate things is I got into mischief, nothing serious crime or anything, but in mischief in school and whatever, because one of the things you always find is the lower level people that are more inclined to get in trouble, drugs and all that sort of stuff, they're willing to take anybody in pretty much. But the higher class the intelligent people are not so much taking some loser or a guy that can't even pass a, you know, sharp math or something they're not looking to to associate so you end up with the losers basically so luckily i didn't and the big thing that turned me around was two things especially was track and field so when i was in high school i started i got on the track team it gave me some real interest in something and i was successful at it so it really I didn't mind going to school, even though I never, high school, I never studied, never did any, not even for tests. I didn't do any work basically through high school. I just basically walked through it and just, you know, enjoyed the running. And I had, I was a good looking guy when I was younger. I had a lot, you know, I had dates and I had a good time basically. 
as as the child, your father is out of the picture, your your mother may be in the picture, but you're living at boarding school. What kind of a relationship did you have with her then? Well, both of them, the father wasn't really out of the picture. I never I don't remember ever living with him as a kid because it was preschool, so I don't remember living because we actually did live in a house together, but then they separated, so I don't remember ever living with him as a child, but he was always in the picture in the sense that he would come to visit us at the boarding schools, both of them did. So they both came and there was like, on weekends they would come and visit, or during the week, because my father was a pharmacist and he could have, you know, he would have different schedules. Sometimes he worked weekends, sometimes he wouldn't, whatever. So they would both come and take us out and, you know, we spent some, a few hours together outside of the boarding schools. So it wasn't totally. And then actually my fa- parents didn't live together, but my father eventually bought his father's drugstore. And I actually worked for my father in his drugstore in high school and college. So I did, you know, I did have time with him. But one of my defense mechanisms is because I was never brought up living with him. My two brothers really resented him because he wasn't in the picture the way you were saying. So one of the things in my scenario was I just never really viewed him in a sense, you know, as my father. This this guy I work with, I know him, whatever, but I wasn't having those big expectations of how I got to be treated so nice by my dad and have this great relationship and whatever. I just never really looked at it that way. I just kind of looked at it like you were saying, he was out of the picture as my dad. He was the guy I worked for and whatever. And, you know, we did spend time together. I actually did live with him for, for about a year when I was uh, waiting, well, like I said, graduated from college. I was teaching at the time. I was waiting for my current wife to finish a year of school after she graduated, we were getting married. So for one year, I did live with him in his house. So he wasn't out of the picture. At, at boarding school, again, a, a young child who's uh, now a lot to process, if you should choose. I know you said you had low self-esteem. You got into some trouble, some, you know, light mischief. What did you, what were you telling yourself during those years about the current situation? Were you just like, F this, or you know what, I'm going to get through this, or something different? No, I was just kind of a wise guy. My brother, my older brother always said, you're such a wise guy. You're always fooling around, just having a, basically, I, I wasn't like a real downer or whatever. I basically, you know, went to school, didn't, you know, like I said, did when I said, once I got in high school and the things really turned around, I got on the track team and then it really changed my life to a large extent. I wasn't so much nothing. Because the key thing is, you know, you're always here. You got to have a reason to get up in the morning. And basically younger, I didn't have much reason to get out of bed in the morning. But once I was on the track team, had some interest that gave me something to look forward to, something I could do and something I could do well. That's so. amazing. So you do that. Then the um, uh, guidance counselor tells you college doesn't want you. You're just average. How did you transition from graduating high school into college? Well, because I never took any college prep courses and I never took the SATs, I started out actually going to a two-year junior college, which is getting more popular today because with college expenses so crazy, some people say I'll go to two-year community college, junior college first, and then I'll transfer to the four-year school. So that's what I did. I went to two years at a junior college and then I transferred to Salem Mm. State, now university, and then I finished my undergraduate there. In what? In business administration. And what did you think you were going to go for at that point in life? Actually, by the time I graduated, I knew I wanted to be a college professor. One of the things I was very lucky with is I learned early what I wanted to do. Because when I was in that junior college, I had a young professor in the course, Principles of Management, had him for a couple of classes. But I really liked that course, Principles of Management. He was a young guy, kind of motivational, got me more interested in academics and more interested in business. And I just decided, well, I want to be a college professor like him. And so it's easy if you're in your, you know, 
first or second year and you know, yeah, I want this. It makes it a lot easier to go for it. Then that's what I did. How is the relationship with your mom and dad at that point in your life? I was still living with my mother and I was working and seeing my father regularly because I worked in the store. So no anger or resentment, really. You were all, all over that. Oh, yeah. My mom was great. She really was. She was. She let me slide a lot because I like I said, I would get into mischief at school and do things. It's stupid stuff as a kid, like still, you know, Halloween, grab a kid's can- candy and run off and stuff like that. And, you know, it's just silly stuff like that. I said I got into mischief, get in trouble at school. She had to go in and bail me out etc. So that kind of stuff. But she was good. She was very loving and patient with me. And luckily, she was kept praying for me that I'd turn around and I did. <laughs> so many of us can relate to just a, a, a gut wrenching comment like that guidance counselor college doesn't want you. How much of that voice was motivating and through your head as you're working your way through college and creating the life that you want? I really didn't let it bother me to speak of. I just went my way and went to the two-year school. And I wasn't sure originally. I was thinking maybe I would just do two years of college. Till, like I said, when I was in that junior college, I had that motivation to actually to go for it and to go to become a professor. So when I originally started, I was thinking maybe I'll just do the two-year school. Hmm. And what's... What's amazing is you, we know where you are today and in, in, in grammar school and preschool and, and, and your, your, your youth boarding schools and high school, no real formal education. So it was all within you. It was all a possibility clearly. Yeah, basically, I've just when I was in college, I had to start learning how to study because I never studied basically before in high school. I never did, basically didn't study. And like even for tests, I wouldn't even study for tests because basically, you know, when you're in not in the college prep class, you're, you know, they're just expecting you to basically be, I don't know, what you call it, you know, not the intellect is going to go on to college. So they don't push you that hard or anything. So you could just get by by going to class and listening and passing the test. But I now mean, it's just getting solid C's. I was not, I never got A's, never got any A's or I don't even know if I got any B's in a, through all of high school. So I just had to learn how to study and just spend that time actually reading the books because I never read the books in high school. I had to actually read the books and I would outline chapters and take notes in class and spend the time studying. I just, one of the things that I think does help and a lot of people say is sports does help to give you that discipline. So having, you know, gone, being on track and I still ran in college as well. So I had the discipline to get the work done. And I just basically said, I got to put in the time and the effort to study and get the grades. So I, you know, I did well academically because I put in the time and the effort, not because I had the natural ability. Such an important point. How did you get on the road when you had the desire to, and the vision, oh, I want to become a college professor. How did that happen after graduating? Yeah, well, the key thing is you can't come out of undergraduate and then go on to be a college professor. So basically, I knew I had to get a master's. And <laughs> you want to come out with all the, the uh, <laughs> all right. So basically, what happened was I never took SATs, as I mentioned, because once you go to a two-year school, you don't have to take them. And then when you go to four-year school, they don't care about SATs. They go by your two years and what your cumulative grade is and what your grades were to go to the four-year school. The unfortunate thing is you can't come out with an undergrad. So I knew I had to go to grad school. So what I did at that point is I had to take what's called the GMAs, the Graduate Management Admissions Test. And I did poorly on it. Bottom 25% because I had no background from a college prep. As you know, if you ever take any of the SATs or advanced ones, there's a lot of algebra and a lot of, you know, a lot of shapes and trigs and all that math stuff, which I never had. I never had any of that in high school. And in college, all I had was basically algebra. So I had no background at all to do well. And I was no good at reading something really fast and memorizing all the facts. So I didn't do well. So what happened was I applied to MBA programs, knowing I'd had at least a minimum MBA. 
and I got rejected. I didn't get accepted to any of the Boston schools. So I said, okay, well, if I get a master's in education instead, it's easier to get in an education program. They don't require a standardized test at Suffolk University where I went at the time. And so I started in that program and took a couple of courses. I was taking courses and I knew that an education degree really isn't what I wanted. So what I ended up doing is I was teaching at the time in high school, working on the master's on the, you know, as well. And then I just said, this isn't going fast enough. So what happened was I played organizational politics in the sense that I found out at Suffolk University who was a key person who would get me into the program because I had got rejected. So I found out it was a guy named Joel Corman. So I went and talked to him and he says, all right, set me up with the dean with a recommendation to give me a trial acceptance. So I was given a trial acceptance. They said, over the summer, take two courses. If you get at least two B pluses, we'll let you in as a regular student. So I got an A and a B plus. So I was admitted as a regular student in the MBA program. But again, it's from my perseverance is how I got there. I mean, if you really want to look at it, I could have gone somewhere else to get in an MBA program because there were other schools at the time, like out here in Western Mass, West New England University, really would let anybody in and just get these on a couple of courses and then you're accepted. So they didn't have the stricter requirements as the better Boston schools at the time. So mm. basically I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to go to a better school. So Suffolk University was AACSB accredited. So I, I actually did get it there. So what I ended up doing is going full time to finish it. And my wife was working as an x-ray technician. So she, sh she supported me for the year while I did my MBA. And I actually got a teaching job through my mentor, that guy, Joel Corman, that I mentioned. And he got me a, at Middlesex Community College to teach that course that I really loved. It was principles of management that I took as the under, at the undergrad level, which I liked so much. So he got me a job. And that actually paid for my tuition. So it actually worked out pretty well. It gave me some college experience and it also helped pay for my MBA the second semester. So it worked out well. Then mm -hmm. from there, I got it. After I finished the MBA, I got a job teaching at a at college level. So that I, was the road that I got there. I love how, like you said, perseverance played an important part. Just that one idea to go speak to the man who became Joel Corman, right? That's who you went to ultimately speak to, became your mentor. How, how important is something like, because it, it seems inspired, it seems like uh, an innovative idea that just, how important is, is that for you as a business person to be able to do and execute on? Well, one of the things is so critical that helps so much in success is, you know, everybody talks about networking and Facebook networking and LinkedIn and all that. But it is critical to have a network of help because as so many people say, nobody succeeds 100% on their own. Everybody gets helped along the way. So that's a big factor. But I was smart enough to play organizational politics to, to get in. So I was willing to say, well, how can I get in through the back door? And essentially, you might want to say, but that's how I did it. I just, you know, went and talked my way in. So they basically said, you know, well, in the interview, knowing me, seeing me, and that knowing that I had taken some graduate courses in education, they said, well, this guy can do it. And they let me in. You are literally a case study in one of the things you teach, strategies of successful startups. You, I'm sure you teach that very well because you lived it. You are the case study. Help us understand, how, how can we get, because you know, many, many of us will start our businesses because it's our passion, it's, it's, it's exactly what we want to do, but then there's that missing piece, we'll, we'll launch, we'll, we'll create, we'll do, we'll open for business, and we hear crickets. So unfortunate, but not a necessity. How do we get people to care about what we are doing? Well, that's a great one. Let me uh, just read one quote to you from Brian Bexley, who's one of the co-founders of Airbnb. He says, quote, when you're starting a company, it never goes at the pace you want. 
you start, you build it, and then you think everybody's going to care. But nobody cares, not even your friends. So like Airbnb, they were told, this will never work. You can't succeed. A lot of people will tell you if you're talking about starting a business, oh, you can't do that. Yeah, that won't work. That will never work. You can't do that. So a lot of, you got to stay away from the naysayers, but you also have to be realistic. And I think one of the big mistakes, if you're talking about successful entrepreneurship, is two things. One is you have to make sure you have a good competitive advantage. I mean, there's pretty much nothing new out there that you're going to do that nobody else is doing. So the key you have to ask yourself, if you want to start a restaurant, what are the other restaurants doing? There's other competition. What are you going to do differently that's going to make somebody come to you, to your business? And if all you say is we're as good as the competition, then maybe you better forget about going into business if you don't have any clear distinction. And if you're going to sell your business, you've got to be saying, how do, you, how do you beat the competition? And the key, you know, three key things they always talk about is can you do it better? Can you do it faster? Can you do it cheaper? Those are keys. If you can do something better than the competition, faster than they can or cheaper than they can, but a good quality, then you're probably going to have something to go for. But if you have no distinction, there's no reason why anybody's going to come to you. And the second thing that goes with a competitive advantage is one of the quotes that I liked is never start your business focusing on raising money. It's a lot of people, oh, I got to go get some money to start a business. No, the first step you got to do is focus again, like I said, sales. Entrepreneurship is all about sales because too many people will start a business just thinking. I make the greatest pizza. Everybody's going to love my pizza. My pizza shop's going to be such a great success. But nobody tests it. And nobody does, I shouldn't say nobody. I mean, Tom's of Maine was the excellent example on that one. Basically, he didn't just come out with a shoe and start selling it with his motto, buy, you know, if you buy a shoe from us, we'll give one to a poor, poor person. He didn't just say people are going to like this. He literally got a bunch of profile shoes that he had made and he invited friends to come to a get together and he displayed the shoes and he asked them, will you buy the shoes? So a lot of people just talk to their friends. Oh yeah, I, I, I would go and buy that shoe. I would, yeah. No, a lot of people, especially friends are going to say, oh, of course I like it. I would buy that, but will they? So he didn't just ask for their opinion, would they? He asked them, give me the money today and buy these shoes today. And people bought them. And they said, oh, I'll be happy to go out there and you know, sell your shoes. And they went out and told the story. And they got other people to buy the shoes. So he didn't start by rushing out and raising money. He started by getting sales. And one thing you got to remember, even if you want to raise money, investors don't invest in ideas. They want some concrete that you can actually make this business run. If you ever watch the Shark Tank, one of the questions they always ask is, how many have you sold so far? What's your sales? And then if a person says, well, I sold two, you know, well, maybe you better go back and, and get some sales before you actually want me to give you some money. We want to prove that you can do this. And if you run out there and start, you're spending money starting, you have no prior sales. And then you find out, oh, I spent all this money setting up my business and now it doesn't work because I, I, I can't sell it. I Nobody love, yeah. I love how um, it's, it's uh, in your example with uh, Tom's of Maine there. It's not just that, oh, I'm going to ask my friends. Because like you said, yeah, our friends are going to yes us in every way. And he said, no, 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 then, then, then please purchase one. Let's see. And that's a great example that no matter what product or service we're offering, don't just ask people what they think of this, if they like it, if they would. Go out and sell it. it it's such a, such a simple, simple thing to do. But then that's when you become the entrepreneur. That's when you become the business person when you have gone from idea and executed on that and made some sales. That's a really interesting point there. 
Yeah, like I said, it's just so common. And one of the things, you know, in entrepreneurship with all my research and everything, you just find that a lot of people just think they got this great idea and they rush out and start a business. And then they find out that, well, maybe the demand isn't really there. Let's talk about management style for a minute, because I know a lot of what you do and teach and talk about and publish is about management. Is there something that we could, we, we could look at as a gauge or a checklist to determine if we would be a good manager or if we are the best manager possible for our business and people? Well, that's a tough one because one of the key things is there's a big difference between being an employee and being a manager because unless you're really a small business and you're going to be doing all of the work yourself, if you're truly a manager, you get to the level where you have people, you know, actually doing the work and you're focusing more on the management. There are four primary functions that all managers should be performing. One is the planning. Somebody's got to plan the schedule of what's going to be made, when, where, how, all that sort of stuff. Somebody have to do some planning. Who's, going to, who's actually going to work, what days, what, all that planning stuff has to be done. Organizing. You got to hire the people and put them in a position. You got to teach them how to do their job. You got to train them, evaluate them, et cetera. So you got to organize, put people in the jobs to get the objectives. But one of the key things, as I'm mentioning, is we should start with objectives. What's the end result that we're trying to achieve? And then you plan how you're going to achieve. Then you organize putting people in positions so that it can be achieved. Then the leadership piece is influencing people to achieve that objective. So how do you motivate people? And the key thing with motivation is you got to get people that are really interested in the job. You know, if you, one of the things that Marriott always said is the advertise, well, I mean, excuse me, attitudes are the critical success of their business. If you don't have people with good attitudes, they want to be there, they want to be cheery, they want to say hello to the customers and be nice, to get it. And bad attitudes are contagious. I mean, if you're in a business and everybody's walking around, this place sucks, everybody's complaining all the time, what kind of an atmosphere is that? How are you going to motivate people with that type of a mentality? So you've got to get good people. The staffing piece is so critical to get good people that want job that know what they're doing i mean if you're talking about a fish store who do you want somebody who loves fish and they have a fish tank and they know something about it they can sell it and they can help they're going to be you know just don't bring somebody in and teach them how to be fish if they don't even have fish i mean you got to have somebody who's interested in some passion for that job and not you know some jobs aren't glamorous but there are people that they very happy in cleaning up the place and sweeping or whatever. There are people that are happy to do those jobs, but you got to get the people that are, want those types of jobs, not somebody who's just taking it because they got nothing else. I mean, you got to get people who want to do the job, and that's so critical with the leadership. You got to influence people and got to motivate them, but you can't if they don't have a good attitude and they don't want to be there and doing the job. But you got to treat people right as well. I mean, if you're mean to people and you treat them like dirt, they're never going to come through for you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of abusive supers, supervisors out there, and that's sad. But I mean, this is, you know, the old golden rule, treat people as you want them to treat you. If you're not nice to people, you're not courteous, you're not motivating them by complimenting them. If you're always yelling at people, bad mood all the time, yelling at everybody, how, how are you going to motivate them to want to do a good job for you? They're not going to come through for you. They're not. And I always like the statement the one guy said, if you focus on doing things for your employees, not to your employees, because there's just too many managers just shafting their employees. And, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that always kills me is some people at nickel and diamond. I mean, for example, you're a hiring person in a big corporation and you're, chins you know, you're chinching the guy down a couple of thousand dollars, whatever. I mean, it's not your money anyway. If you're going to give the person what they're worth, et cetera, you're going to be more motivated to actually do the job. I mean, why do you think Microsoft and F Facebook and all those big corporations that are so highly successful, they're not on the low end of the paying spectrum. They're on the higher end because they know that people want to be treated right in what they feel they're worth. And if you're trying to chinch people down and, you know, take advantage of them, they're not going to be motivated. You're not going to get the good people. 
it's in reality, you know, there's this old saying that goes for people, you get what you pay for. I mean, if you know, if you want to get somebody who's no experience and do the job, and that's one of the tough parts about small business, you got to get people for the most part that have some experience and can do the job. It's so critical because you don't have the resources like a corporation to put someone through a year's training program. I mean, you got to, it's tough. It's mm -hmm. tough to, you know, people don't realize how hard it is to make a small business run and make a profit. It's not easy to get people apart from their money. And that's, I want to read another quote to you pertaining to that. Because one of the things you're talking about with your competitive advantage, what are you going to do different than the competition to get them to come to you? So what we're talking about is change. People are already going to the same restaurant, for example. You want them to go to your restaurant. How are you going to do that? You've got to make people change. What's the incentive? And this is a great quote that I like about, um, about the, that idea. Let me find it here. Okay. All right. So people generally don't want to change their buying habits and routines. So the quote here, which I like, is only a baby with a wet diaper likes change. So keep that in mind. Only a baby with a wet diaper likes change. So you got to have a hard time. It's tough to get people to part with their money. It really is. I mean, you know, if you're asking somebody to come in and buy something from you, it's not easy. I mean, ever been walking in a store and there's somebody out there trying to get money, raise money or whatever? It's tough. Most people just walk right by and they won't even look at them, et cetera. And they're out there, hey, how you doing? How you doing? How's your day? How's your day? They're trying to be nice and everything, but it's so tough to get people to part with their money. It really is. Mm, so much, so much good in that. I appreciate all that. So much good to think about. What would you, looking back on, on your story, on your history, again, an inspiring case study on going from really nothing to, to this today. I mean, what you've accomplished for yourself from now that we know the story and how you were raised in the, in the boarding school system and whatnot. Looking back on that, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, the key thing, as I said, I had no interest in education as a kid. If I went back again, I'd take it more serious and actually study and learn and take college prep all the way through high school. But obviously, I can't go back and do that. But the key thing is, as I said, if you go back to that formula of performance, performance equals the ability times the motivation times the resources. And one of the things that research has shown and they've said is one of the famous authors is saying, ability is overrated. The motivation piece or the perseverance to succeed can really make a big difference. And I, when I talk about this in my course, my management class, I use myself as the example. I didn't have the background academically. I mean, my high school guidance company said, I'm only average. College doesn't want me. How could I go through and get a doctorate degree in all those publications and all the accolades that I've gotten over a million sales? I've had people from over 80 countries. I've people from more than 80 countries have contacted me about my research and my textbooks. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I got a national, international reputation in my field. And why? It's big factors, just the perseverance. I'm willing to work hard. And a lot of people just aren't willing to work hard. How do we connect mindset to that? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you, what you mean by the mindset. I mean, part of it is the attitude. You just got to, yep. a big part of it is the motivation of yourself. You got to motivate yourself. I mean, you really think I love coming to my office every day, spending all day sitting here by myself at my computer writing textbooks? It's not that easy. You got to motivate yourself. And one of the things that I really love is a guy named Matt, uh, Matthew Kelly. He's a consultant and also runs a nonprofit organization called Dynamic Catholic. And he says one of the unfortunate things is so many people live quiet lives of desperation. They're just going through the motions. They don't like their jobs. They don't like their lives. They're just muddling through. And I don't ever want to be like that. Do you want to be muddling through? I mean, you got to find something that interests you. And a key thing that he says is think about 
when you're doing something, if the time just never goes by, that means you don't like it. If you're doing something and all of a sudden, gee, where did the time go? And I was gone. What happened? What, where's the time gone? Then that's something that motivates you. That's something that interests you. So if you can try to run whatever interests you into a job or a way of making a living, you're going to be a lot happier. And that's one of the things that I, like I said, I really like to teach and I've got the ability to do it. And that's a big factor of my success and my happiness in life is because that's so important. And relationships is so important. That's a big factor too. And that's, you know, having a family, support a family really helps. I got a great wife who supported me over all these years. Very, you know, encouraging. She doesn't mind me hiding in my office all day, all the time. <laughs> do, you be do you believe everything happens for a reason? I'm not sure about anything happens for a reason, but the reality is I just think you got to take what you're given and make the best of it. I mean, luckily, like I said, most people in my case that are brought up in foster homes, boarding schools, I mean, some of the kids I hung around with in, in grammar school, they dropped out of high school at age 16. Some of them ended up dying of drug overdoses and stuff. That could have been me too. I mean, that's a lot of kids in the same scenario that I did never, never get out of it. And it's so tough. I think of, it's, I can't say, oh, it's easy to just do like I did in the sense, but a big factor is find something to get yourself away from that. So, you know, I was drinking in high I was drinking in grammar school. I was going out with guys drinking in grammar school. So basically, when I got on the track team, it said, well, these guys are not all going out drinking, getting drunk out of their minds and stuff. I don't want to be smoking cigarettes and dope or whatever. I want to be an athlete. I got to clean this up. And just that made a big difference. Are you spiritual or religious in any ways today? Very much so. I'm a very strong pract uh, pract practicing Catholic. I go to church every Sunday. I pray every day. My wife and I pray together every every night hmm. what do you believe happens when it's all over when our time here on earth ends well i plan on going to heaven i don't know about you <laughs> good enough good enough i will leave you with this final question dr robert lucier how would you like to be remembered oh that's a tough one i really never give a lot of thought to that i don't know Basically, it's a good dad and an accomplished professional, I guess. Wow. Good dad and husband, like I said. I got my priorities and sense. God first, then my family, then my work, then my exercising. So those are my four key priorities in life, and I get all of those done. Mm, I have to ask, because you just brought up your role as a dad, and now connecting to how you uh, had a relationship with your father growing up, how, do, how did that play a part? How do you view your role as a father today? Are you trying to do, do differently? Are you trying to use what worked? How are you as a father? Okay, one of the things this, you know, mentioned, I only have six children, so I don't know anything about, I've only <laughs> have six children, that's the first thing. Wow. But one of the key things, knowing what I went through as a kid, and no, you know, all, every divorce or separation, the kids always suffer. There's no question about it. So me and my brother suffered dramatically through it, especially when we went through it, nobody else was going through it. I mean, when we went to school, we were like the only kids in the class. Their parents didn't live together. So it was even worse when we went through it. So basically, I had a commitment that I knew that I was not going to let my kids go through what I went through. And I didn't care what was going to happen. I was going to make it work, my marriage. And I was going to be a good dad. I'd be there and do the best I could. And I wasn't going to let them down like my dad did. It all makes such beautiful sense. I thank you. If anybody wants to get in touch with you and take this conversation further, how can they best do that? Well, as I mentioned, my website is www.publishdonotperish.com. And I still use my college email, which is rlucier, L-U-S-S-I-E-R, at springfield.edu. That's my email address. We will certainly link to all of that in the show notes right around this video. I was not fibbing when I said a gentleman and a scholar 
Dr. Robert Lucier, thank you, sir, for joining us and opening up and providing with us with all of this. I thank you dearly. No, it was my pleasure, Josh. I enjoyed it. But I like talking rather than being list these and list that, like I said. So, well, good. I I'm talking. good. I'm glad we had this conversation. For everybody tuning in, I know your time is precious as well. I hope you got a ton out of this. There is so much more where this came from. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, go get them. <laughs>